about the chance to study through Romans 11 with you. So let's turn in our Bibles to Romans 11, title of our study this morning, A Faithful God. We are living in the last days, the days promised by the prophets and confirmed by Jesus. He tells us in Matthew 24 that these things that have always been taking place, famines and pestilence and earthquakes and, well, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom and, well, False Christ and false prophets abounding. We know that's always been happening, but he says in the last days they'll increase in frequency and intensity. And we see both happening. But it's important to note, there have been seasons throughout church history where similar things have happened. And people thought, this is it. These are the last days. Here's why we can be sure these are the last days. God promised that in the last days, he would do something that's never been done. He likes to do that. Take something that never been done, that can't be done, and then make it happen. Why? He says that's how we can know it's him. He said he was going to regather the nation of Israel back to the land that he first gave to them, and then he was going to do that in unbelief. In other words, they would come back to the land, but not yet to Jesus. Then, he says, later he would open their eyes. In between, well, these are the days in which we're living. What's next on the prophetic calendar? Well, the resurrection of the dead and rapture of the church will come first. The trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise first. We were alive and remain will be caught up together with them to be with him. It's a glorious reunion with those who've gone before us, a time of celebrating and rejoicing in the presence of the Lord as we cast our crowns at his feet and cry, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. So the rapture of the church followed by the tribulation, God's wrath poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. Now, during that season of tribulation, somewhere during the seven-year period, divided into the tribulation and the great tribulation, latter three and a half years, Israel's eyes will be opened. In other words, he's restored them to the land as a sign to them and to us that it's really him. And here's what happened in church history. For the first few hundred years, most believers took it literally that Israel would be regathered. They were dispersed in 70 AD, but the promises were to the nation that God would bring them back. And then someone came up with the idea, well, maybe he didn't mean it literally. Maybe the church are heirs of the promises made to Israel. Here's the promise with that, or the problem with that. Israel and the church have been, are today, and will always be distinct. God had a specific plan, made specific promises to them. They were to inherit temporal blessings and earthly places. What does he tell us about our blessings? We have uh, eternal blessings in the heavenlies, reserved and kept for us in Christ Jesus. They were promised a land. We're promised the Lord. Now, they're going to have both, but here's my point. Over the centuries, and well, it's been nearly 20, and, and so what's happened? Well, more and more people have bought into the idea, well, maybe he didn't mean it literally. Then in 1948, we find them not only back in the land, but a nation once again. Now, they're living in unbelief. The majority of people in Israel not only reject Jesus as the Messiah, many of them reject the idea there's even a God. It is, for the most part, lots of secularism, many atheists and agnostics there. But God's promise is that he will open their eyes. So we have the coming resurrection and rapture, then the tribulation, the restoration of the nation of Israel, then Jesus returns to the earth for a literal thousand-year reign and rule where he tells us we will return with him and rule and reign alongside of him. That's the promised kingdom, you see. And Israel will be a part of that kingdom. Well, God, of course, 
promised to keep us from the tribul tribulation, tribulation, whatever. He promised to keep us from both. And, uh, but but uh, in, in Luke, Jesus said, pray that you'll be found worthy to escape all these things that will come upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man. The second is actually the most important. It's not just protected and hidden during the tribulation, but in the presence of God, worshiping as his wrath is being poured out and saying, that is so right, Lord, that is so perfect. Everything God does is right and just and perfect. Well, we have pictures, of course, of God keeping his people from the hour of tribulation. Noah was in the ark with his family before his wrath was poured out on that generation. We'll talk about Noah again in a bit. Lot rescued out of Sodom before his wrath was poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah. But we have an even more interesting picture when Daniel's three friends go into a time of tribulation because we have no clue where Daniel was. All we know is Daniel wasn't there. And I think Daniel in that scene where Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego are cast into the fiery furnace where Jesus actually walks with them and preserves and protects them. Well, I think Daniel's absence is a picture for us. See, Daniel representing the church that will be taken out before the wrath of God. And, and then Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego representing Israel who were preserved through the tribulation and in the tribulation. Well, in any case, all of this leads us to verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? The answer, of course, Certainly not. The question arises because we know Israel was unfaithful to God. The question then is, will God be unfaithful to Israel? Paul just says that can't happen. Why? Well, we serve a God who Paul tells us later cannot lie. And he made promises that can only be fulfilled in them and to them and even through them. Now, Paul gives a series of of illustrations, of, of proofs, if you will. He makes himself the first. He says, God's not done with Israel. Here's how you can know. I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who you should know, and if you're new to all this, you need to know, Jacob becomes Israel. Israel. God changes his name after the most interesting mixed martial arts evening. He wrestles with God all night and finally as God's saying, hey, it's daybreak, I'm taking off. He, he, he says, no, don't leave without blessing me. And he clung to him and cried out to him and God says, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name will now be Israel. Israel, if you're unaware, means governed by God. Jacob, who was like the Frank Sinatra of his day, he did it his way, now finds out it's got to be the Lord. And that's exactly what happens. So he says, God was faithful, will be, has been, will always be faithful to Israel in spite of their unfaithfulness to him. And that is security for us because, well, we have been unfaithful to. We have not perfectly represented our Lord in our day. We're the light of the world, he says. But some of us, well, we don't really seem that bright. And, and so God is saying, look, I'm going to use you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to transform you. And, and it's all him from beginning to end. He says God has not cast away his people. And by the way, he means Israel here. How do we know? He says, I'm an Israelite. We read it. Seed of Abraham, tribe of Benjamin. The church has never been made up of the tribes of Israel. There will be Israelites, though, in the church. And we'll see that in a moment. A beautiful illustration from the first century. And so it's not that those who are of Israel can't be a part of the church. It's just the church never became a part of Israel. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets, torn down your altars, and I alone am left. And they seek my life. 
But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Elijah was suffering from what we might call a Noah complex. See, in Noah's day, Noah was the only righteous man. Elijah's thinking, I'm the only one left, Lord. I mean, they've killed your prophets, they've torn down your altars, and now they're after me. There actually was just a one. It was a, not a he, but a she. He'd faced off with the 450 prophets of Baal successfully. Did them in, took them down. And then he hears Jezebel's after him, and he runs and hides. Now, that might be wisdom. You know, not afraid of 450 guys, afraid of one woman. She was a woman who was, you know, very wrathful and vengeful and dangerous. But, but listen, God sees what's up. And, and I remember my buddy Gail Irwin saying, if you're going to hide from God, I wouldn't suggest his backyard. And, and here's Elijah, not so much hiding from God, but hiding from Jezebel. And so what happens? God appears to him. Elijah's traveled a great distance. He's hiding out in a cave. And God shows up, and, and, and as he comes, we're told there was a great wind, but God was not in the wind. There was a great earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. Then a great fire, but God was not in the fire. And then there was a still, small voice. And it's such an encouragement to me, and hopefully to you as well. It's saying, when you're in sin, when you're disobeying, when you're fearing, when you're running, when you're whimpering and complaining and, and Elijah's doing all those things it's not the big wind uh, or, or the earthquake or the fire God comes and speaks to us he whispers in our ear what are you doing here what's the matter with you what are you doing way out here your ministry's back there oh Lord don't you know what's up Usually he's pretty aware, I found. And, and, and the deal is he's like, look what they've done. And, and I'm the only righteous guy left. I hope you never feel like that. I never, I never feel isolated from the fellowship of the saints. And, and no matter what happens, I realize I'm one among millions of people that love and worship and serve our Lord. But Elijah's thinking, I'm the only one. Now, I mentioned that the church never became Jewish, but that's not to say that Jews haven't become or aren't a part of the church. No, they have been down through the ages. In fact, the first church was there in Jerusalem, and it was birthed only 40 days after the cross. People had come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. Now, who attended that feast? The Jews, the Israelites from the 12 tribes, they all came to celebrate. There were proselytes, so some were Gentiles, and they were trying to become Jews because Jews had, well, they had a relationship with God. They had a temple. They had the feast. They had the festivals. They had the sacrifices. They had the word of God, the Old Testament. They had the prophets. They had the history. They had the prophecy. And so, so what happens is, is they gather for Passover and Jesus dies at the Passover feast. He dies for our sins, is buried, and rose again. Forty days later, the Spirit of God is poured out at the Feast of Pentecost. Who's attending? Mostly Jews. Well, when I say Jew, I'm talking about the nation, but Jew technically, that would be a descendant of Judah. See, Judah, Jew. So, so uh, Israel is actually the 12 tribes. And so they were back to attend the feast. So when 3,000 people responded to Peter's preaching of the gospel that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again, a church of 120 became a church of 3,120. Most of them, almost all of them, were certainly Jewish or Israelite in their background. So my point in sharing that is that the early church was in fact the proof, and that's what Paul's saying here, that God preserved a remnant of Israel. Lots of people were unfaithful, but these people responded to Jesus. They responded to the gospel. Jesus became 
their Savior as he's become our Savior. Now, Paul's writing to the Romans. The church at Rome was primarily made up of Gentiles. That's not to say there weren't any Jewish believers there. And one of the issues he'll deal with as you go through the various letters he writes, and that's what's happening, letter to Rome, letter to the church at Corinth, letter to the church uh, there in the region of Galatia, and there's 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Corinth is just another city. So, so as you read those letters, understand that's what you're reading, a letter to a church just like ours in a certain location in the first century. Well, what happened is there were a lot of Jewish Christians, especially in Jerusalem, that thought, well, in order to really be a good Christian, those Gentiles should become Jewish. They needed to be circumcised. They needed to keep the law. We've looked at this, and we'll consider it again as we press through Paul's various letters. And, and the whole deal is, again and again, Paul defends, no, it's not about Christians becoming Jews. It's about Gentiles and, and Jews becoming Christians, finding the Messiah, Jesus, the Savior, Jesus, the Anointed One, Jesus. So he says, hey, I'm a living example that God hasn't given up on Israel. And what about the people that God has preserved and transformed and used down through the ages? Verse 5, he says, and he's writing in the first century, even so then at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, here's what happens. Because so many people teach just a verse or a phrase or get a concept and don't really see the context of all of that, it would be easy if I were only teaching verse 5 to focus on the words remnant and the, the, the word election and touch on the reality of grace. But the message here isn't, well, God elected some to be with him and elected others not to be. You know, we elect people, we use that word in a different way. We elect people, then we suffer the consequences. But, but they, when, when we're talking about biblical election, we're talking about God actually choosing people to be with them. And the logical mind, and I think I have one of those, can say, well, if he chose some to be with them, he must have chosen some not to be with them. But here's what happens. You'll never find that in Scripture. There's nowhere it says God chose you for heaven and somewhere else for hell. It just isn't there. So you can't just use logic and take an idea and say, well, if this is true, this must be true. You have to read the whole Bible and you need to put it all together. And if you think, well, no, that's your job. You know, we just come and listen to you. Well, that's fine except for... God is going to hold you accountable because you have a Bible. We're not living in the first century where you couldn't get a copy. In fact, how many of you have a smartphone? I'm just curious, and I really want to see your hands. I know there are more of you. Quick. Okay, listen. If you have a smartphone, you can download the Bible for free. Multiple versions are available. Multiple translations are available. There's no excuse for not having the Bible with you all the time. I don't carry a big Bible around with me, you know, like so everybody knows. No, I, I, but I have my phone and I have the Bible. And when I'm sitting in traffic, which happens, or not as much here as when we were in Southern Cal recently, but, but uh, when I'm in a doctor's office or waiting somewhere for someone, like when I went shopping with Pam and waited for five hours, I... Uh, <laughs> I, 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 that actually happened, by the way. I had a book and almost finished it, but, but, I, but I, I just opened my phone and read the Bible, and, and, it's, and I want to encourage you to do the same thing because God says study and show yourself approved. Not just study with the pastor, but study yourself because he will open the word to you. And if you read it in context and you just take it at face value, you'll be surprised to see that you understand most of what you read. This idea that, well, we can't understand the Bible. I think that was a lie started by the enemy. That, oh, you can't understand it. It's too complicated. Revelation, people say, oh, it's so complicated. You can't understand it. And God says, blessed is the one who reads it and blessed is the one who hears it and blessed is the one who does it. And I'm thinking, so how are we blessed if we can't understand it? The truth is we can understand it, and, and, and we need to. So, 
that the point he's making here is there has always been, just as there was in the day of Elijah, he said, I got 7,000 of you, guy. And, and now he's saying there's always a, a, a remnant according to the election of grace. And the key word here is grace. How do I know? Verse 6, if by grace it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Grace, by the way, if you're unaware, God's riches at Christ's expense. You write it out, G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. It speaks to the reality that all we have from him is a gift. I haven't earned it. I don't deserve it. It's not a reward for my faithfulness. It's a testimony to his goodness and his faithfulness. Well, again, there was a remnant because the early church was made up of people from Israel, especially the church in Jerusalem, as I shared. James writes to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. He knows that they're dispersed, but it doesn't matter to him. He figures the letter will get circulated, and those of a Jewish heritage, they'll all get it. Jesus, though, nails this for us. When he tells his disciples, in the regeneration, you who followed me will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, if you're thinking, well, does it really matter if it's really Israel or if the church is Israel? Absolutely, because the rapture is something promised to the church. The tribulation is something promised to Israel, and then their restoration. So I have Jewish friends, and they're like, well, I am a Christian, but I really feel like I need to worship as a Jew, and that makes no sense to me. I'm not saying it's wrong to celebrate the feast or the festivals, we celebrate Passover, and sometimes we'll do a feast here at church. And, but but the, the point is, we don't want to get caught up in the law. We don't want to get caught up in the ceremony or the, 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 the very thing that kept them from really seeing Jesus. Well, he goes on then to say, What then? Verse 7, Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear to this very day. David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see and bow down their backs always. Now, he's talking about Abe's un believing descendants those who were a descendant of abraham isaac jacob who becomes israel the ones who walked in unbelief they were judged those who believed like abraham they were declared righteous abraham believed god and it was accounted to him for righteousness and they were saved some reading this if you're really tracking with it you'll say well it seems weird it's like God's not letting them see and he's keeping them from hearing? Well, yes and no. Like Pharaoh who hardened his heart and then God confirmed Pharaoh's decision, something we see as a good thing because we've set our hearts on him and we're like, secure us, Lord. Make us sure in you. If you'll harden Pharaoh's heart to, to just acknowledge and, and, and affirm his decision, well, we've decided for Jesus, and he'll do the same for us. He will cement us in that relationship. But, but what it says here is that he's blinded them, and he's stopped up their ears. Let me read you why that happened. Jesus says in Matthew 13, it's in response to their response. For the hearts of this people has grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes, they have closed. It's Matthew 13, 15. What he's saying is they had heart problems that led to hearing problems and eye problems. But it all comes back to the heart. They were going through the motions, but they didn't have a heart for God. They were doing all the religious stuff, but they weren't really ready for the Messiah. So when he came, instead of embracing him, they crucified him. And, and, and so what he's saying is, 
their hearts are hardened and, and God, well, he's not unjust to say, okay, well, then be hardened. You know, they're, they're shutting their eyes. He's not going to, you know, do this and make them look, you know. We don't even do that to our kids. We're like, open your eyes and look at me right now. If you're raising kids, you've done it. You've said it. I've said it to my boys, and now I'm saying it to, to you know, the grandchildren. Look at me when I talk to you, right? And, and, and the point is, if they shut their eyes and they stop their ears, I don't force the issue. I know they can still hear me. And I'm like, you're not going to like what comes next. You're going to stand in the corner. It's going to be time out. I'd like to suggest to you, God's given Israel a time out, but he hasn't cast them off. He's not unfaithful to them, though they've been unfaithful to him. Well, he says, have they stumbled, verse 11, that they should fall? And he means, was the purpose of their stumbling a fall? And is that fall forever? Is it permanent? His answer, just as it was in verse 1, certainly not. God forbid, some of the translations say. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, track with the next couple verses, because if you get into a conversation with people who've bought into this, the church is Israel, replacement theology is what it's called, you just need to understand this section and you can show them. You don't have to be a scholar. You just have to be a student. You can show them that they're wrong. And it's, and it's not just to win the argument. It's to win them. And here's what he says. If their fall is riches for the world, their who? It has to be Israel. They've been the subject from the beginning of the chapter. Actually, from chapter 9, 10, and 11. So if their riches or their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. Now, to me, this is a no-brainer. If their fall is Israel, and it is, if their failure is Israel, because he contrasted with the Gentiles, how much more their fullness, who can there be except Israel? You can't have it. Israel fell, Israel failed, the church is going to experience the fullness. Oh, we already have that in Christ. But he's promising it to them as well. God used their fall and their failure to bless us. How much more, he says, their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, and save some of them. Paul said earlier, he became all things to all men, that he might, by all means, save some. But he had a particular love and passion, as we've seen, for his own brethren, the Israelites. He wanted them to be saved too. And God sends him to the Gentiles, and he has great success among them, but his passion in his heart is still for his brethren. And, and when he says he's going to provoke them to jealousy through us, this actually makes sense if you understand that our riches are spiritual, that our riches are, are well, about our relationship with God. See, that's what they're missing. Those who don't have Christ, well, he is the end of the law, so they're still into the law. He is, he is the end of man's works. He has worked for us. And so he's the end of our trying to be acceptable or good enough or reconcile ourselves to God or somehow please or appease him. All that's done in Christ. So it's saying they're going to look at you and see the joy you have. Hey, this happens when we go to Israel. We have a peace. We have a joy. We love that land. I believe more than they love that land. Now, I don't know because they're living there. Maybe they love it more. But we love it in a different way because we're like, this is where Jesus stood. This is where Jesus taught. This is, the, this is where Jesus walked on water. This is where David slew Goliath. This is where the battle of Armageddon will happen. This is where Elijah faced off the 450 prophets of Baal. I love that land because the word comes alive in it. But listen, you don't have to go to Israel for the word to come alive. You just have to know the word is alive and powerful and read it with an expectation that God's going to really speak and change you through it. He continues his argument. 
If they're being cast away, and again, the question would be, their who has to be Israel. It's the reconciling of the world. What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Hey, he has promised to restore, pour out his spirit, bless, and use them, not just in the tribulation, though that will be a reality. They will be his living witnesses of his ability to protect. He at one point in the book of Revelation seals 144,000. Not from this group or that cult or this ism. It's from the 12 tribes of Israel. And he lists the tribes so that we can be sure he's talking about them. He couldn't be clearer. Then he says, if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. Don't really know if I like being called a lump, but that's okay. It's starting to be more of a reality. And it says, if the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Now, some of the writers that I dearly love and greatly respect at this point say, well, he's talking about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because he's been talking about them. But here's the problem. That's kind of the mindset that led many Jews to think that Christians needed to become Jewish in order to be accepted by the Lord and acceptable to the Lord. And, and, and so what he's saying in, in reality is, well, it's, there's two kinds of branches. There are those that are broken off. That would be the unfaithful among Israel. Those, those that are grafted in here would be those who walk by faith in the church. But both branches are connected to the root. And here's where people get mixed up. The root isn't Israel. The root is Jesus. He said it so clearly. I'm the vine. My Italian friends say, I'm divine. And that's true too. I'm the vine. I'm divine. No one comes to the Father but by me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But he said, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What is the purpose of a branch? Just to produce fruit. See, that's, that's our only purpose. And he says, if you don't produce fruit, well, then he just cuts you off. Is he saying, you Christians who were unfruitful are going to lose your salvation? It isn't even in the discussion. People make it that, and I'm like, wait, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about those who have no faith, who are hanging out with those who do have faith. They're not producing anything because they're not abiding or connected to Jesus. They're not abiding. They're not a part of. And so here's how I know this to be true. Just as there were some in Israel that weren't really of Israel, not spiritually. Spiritual Israel were those who walked by faith like Abraham did. They're the not just physical but spiritual descendants of Abraham. That's what we learned earlier on. Same thing's true in the church. Lots of us grew up in Christian homes. We had Christian parents, not all of us. But if you grew up that way, you might be, as I was, somebody who says, well, I've always been a Christian. There was never really a point where I became a Christian. I've just always known this stuff, so I've always been a Christian. I challenge you to really think about that. Because th th that, that mindset says, well, because I have all the information and I affirm it, I'm, I'm submitted to God. Do you know Israel, did I mention it, means governed by God? And so the church has to be governed by God, not just believers in God, but submitted to God. That'll be chapter 13, by the way, when we get there. So he's saying that, that we've been grafted in and they've been cut off. And then he says, lest any of us get prideful over the whole deal, you may say or will say branches were broken off that I may be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. His point, unbelief, always lead to judgment. That generation that came out of Egypt died in the wilderness, not because of all the sins they committed, 
but ultimately because of their unbelief, their unwillingness to trust the Lord and inherit their inheritance. But what happens? Next generation inherits it. God said to Israel, you're going to have the land. A whole generation says, we don't think we can do it. And he says, okay, stay here and die in the wilderness, but your kids are going in. And that's exactly what happened. So again and again we see it. Unbelief, judgment, faith, well, relationship, fruit, joy, peace, love, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, a righteous witness. And that's exactly what they were called to be and failed to be. That's what we're called to be in our day. We want to make sure we don't follow in their footsteps and fail to shine for him. Therefore, consider, verse 22, the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the wild olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted in to their own olive tree? He's saying two things. He's saying, first of all, be sure you're for real, that you're really in the faith that you're connected to Jesus and abiding in Jesus, producing fruit for Jesus because the branch that isn't will be cut off. That's what happens to them. And he's saying, hey, if you don't continue, if you don't continue in faith, you're not going to produce fruit. And it's not the you know, proof that Christians can lose their salvation. Not at all. I think the person that's cut off is somebody who said they believed but never actually believed. And I can prove it to you. In Matthew 13, Jesus explains the parable of the sower. And, and, and he tells us that the seed is sown in the heart of man. Whether it's the seed of the gospel that saves us from our sins. Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. Or the good seed of God's word that cleanses us and refreshes us and teaches us and nourishes us and helps us grow. Here's what happens. One of four things. The seed can be snatched by the enemy. The moment God tries to sow it, the purpose of the sowing is there'd be fruit. The enemy comes and snatches, steals away that seed. It can be scorched. He says that happens when people receive the word and they're like, whoa, this is awesome. And then they tell people and they're persecuted. and They're like, I didn't sign up for this. And so they just wither away spiritually. And then it can be smothered. I wanted to stay with S's for a change. Seed snatched, scorched, smothered. Hopefully you can remember those. Smothered, yeah, he says the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke out that seed, that that little plant, and it never grows. It never produces what God purposed it to produce. By the way, cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches. He's not talking about all kinds of gross sin and idolatry and immorality. He's just saying the day-to-day -day business of life can actually choke out the truth. So it never really gets fully rooted. It never really produces any fruit. But in the fourth case, the seed takes root in the heart of man. And remember, Israel's problem was a problem of the heart. That's where it starts with us. If the seed takes root, then it will ultimately produce fruit. That will be the proof. Well, I do not desire, he says then in verse 25, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Key words here, in part, until. What's the fullness of the Gentiles? It's an exciting idea in, in theological term. It's talking about the church here. And what it's saying is God has a number. He knows when the last person who's going to respond to the gospel will. And in that moment, the trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ rise first. As we shared in the beginning, we who are alive and remain are caught up together with him and more importantly, with them and him. But, but here's the issue. When that happens, when, when that last person says, yes, we're all going. Now listen, 
I don't know if you have given your life to the Lord or not. And I don't know if you're the last one, but if you're the one holding us up, could you please surrender today? Because I'm ready to go. I, I mean, I, I used to think when I was younger, oh, but what about my kids? I understand they're going too, you see. What about my grandkids? They're going too. It will just be heaven for a season and then earth, which will be like the Garden of Eden. There'll be no war, there'll be no famine, there'll be no riots, there'll be no pestilence, there'll be no earthquakes, there'll be no whirlwinds, there'll be no hurricanes. All of that in the past, there'll be no sorrow or suffering or death. Man, we want that. So the point is that the fullness of, uh, of the Gentiles will come in. And then what does it say? So all Israel, verse 26, will be saved. Now, I've mentioned in the past, I looked all up, and all means all. So some say, so that means every Israelite that ever lived will be saved? No. Here's why. Not all who are of Israel are really Israel. How does that work? There's physical, natural Israel. There's spiritual Israel. Most, well, all of the spiritual Israel is made up of the natural Israel but not everyone born a descendant of those 12 tribes is a believer in God or will become a believer in God, but everyone who believes will be saved. Remember, Israel means governed by God. All who then submit to God, believe and trust in God, put their faith in Jesus, will be saved. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. God promises a new covenant to Israel. Listen to it. It's Jeremiah 31. Well, it's 31, 31 to help you remember. But verse 33 is where I'll pick up for time's sake. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. He's saying, look, that covenant I made, the covenant of law, it didn't work because people didn't keep the law. They misunderstood the law, as we've seen. It was supposed to point them to Christ, but they looked at themselves and thought, I'm golden. And he's like, no, you're sinful. But he says he's got a new covenant. Listen, we are already a part of the covenant where his law is written in our mind and on our heart. We have this in common with them, but he is not through with them concerning the gospel verse 28 they're enemies for your sake concerning the election beloved for the sake of the fathers for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable and all I can say to that is thank you Lord because I have the gift of everlasting life I have the gift of the Holy Spirit I have gifts of and from the Holy Spirit and he says they're irrevocable He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll never stop using us as long as we're trusting in and walking with him. If he sets us aside, he'll bring us back. If there's a time out, we come out of it. Why? We are the children of God, born again of his spirit. For as you were once disobedient to God, we conclude. Verse 30, yet now you have obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so. These also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him and it should be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen and amen and amen. Lord, thank you.